about some of the challenges for security? I mean, look at the Internet of Things. Um, so it looks a bit like the Wild West. <laughs> it is a Wild West, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so how do we get a handle on that? You know, uh, just like any other new technology, it's about figuring out uh, how to secure that technology. And, and Internet of Things is no different. You see a lot of the incidents that we've had recently have been primarily focused around things like including a default password, which we all know is a bad thing to do. Uh, they or they not, have got a password. Hot, hot yeah. <laughs> or a password. <laughs> yeah, or updatable, right? They, they, so you can, you can update the system, you can change the password, right? These are all things that we already know about our computer. They just haven't been applied to IoT. And that's largely because you have manufacturers who've been dealing, building cars mm. or building a refrigerator, yes. and now suddenly they're in a completely new business yeah. and they have no understanding of what that might entail. And so I think it's just really an education game. And I think regulators are starting to get involved already where they're providing at least some, uh, some guidance in terms of how to address these challenges. But again, I, I do think the transparency is pivotal here. I think, you know, mm. all too, it's all too easy, frankly, for an offshore manufacturer to, to, to build a really inherently insecure thing, put it into a shop somewhere, sell thousands of units of it, uh, potentially with the unknowing support of a big tech brand. Um, mm. Careful not to mention any names. Um, <laughs> and the consequences of that just typically aren't known. They're restricted. We know about them yeah. because that's what we do for a living. But, you know, would the next person walking into a unnamed high street store or a visiting an unnamed uh, website to buy a, the cheapest, most capable, I don't know, camera, mm -hmm. webcam they want. They just don't know. So I think, you know, this whole environment, this whole push towards transparency mm -hmm. is, is really relevant so that people can make more informed choices because ultimately it's the market that will drive change, yeah. not the regulator. I think there are, for me, there are two, two ways, two very, very broad brush ways of tackling the, the threat from the Internet of Things. One is exactly your point, which is, the people who manufacture these devices need to be either educated or beaten over the head. So I say beaten over the well, head. Well, people stop I'm, buying their products because they know. Or that, yes. <laughs> yeah. But I, I think, you know, for me, beaten over the head means maybe the security needs to be regulated. Basic security needs to be regulated. Mm -hmm. So there is scope, perhaps, for some government action or trans-government action there. The other aspect is inside the organization, inside the business organization particularly. My view, it's about... Um, the people who have expertise, which might be the IT function, I, I actually rule out the security function because you know, that's, that's too specialized an area to own it, but the people who have some expertise and have a, a, an understanding of the implications of a computer that's wide open, mm -hmm. because that's what the Internet of Things is about, is about, those people need to be given ownership of these devices. So a great example from my not too distant past, which is, you know, great organization, great IT function, great physical security requirement, great physical security organization operating those using CCTV cameras. You can't buy a CCTV camera today without it being essentially internet enabled. None of, well, the vast majority of those internet enabled cameras are not secure by default. So what you end up with is an entirely insecure CCTV network, which is there supposedly to keep you secure. So you have another route for the guys who want to steal your stock, which is to apply a bit of hacking skills, turn off the cameras, break in. So, so is the answer for the chief information security officer, is it just a security officer who's got a much wider remit to cover more than just information, that it should cover? Physical security. Yeah. I think a really good point has been made. I mean, you, you do need experts. You do need people that have deep, but by definition, narrow, um, skills in, in any organization to a variety of things. But I'd liken you know, technology, so there's a great quote, and I, and I, and I use this for my job. Uh, Douglas Adams described technology as something that doesn't quite work yet. Uh, <laughs> and I like it because for me it gives, a, it gives me a good clue as and to how the system is. <laughs> <laughs> something that's never worked. <laughs> something's never worked. <laughs> um, but I use that quite a lot to describe the thematic accountability that I feel that I've got in my organization. You know, so I don't get too sniffy about whether it's CISO, CIRO, whatever. Uh, and there's two things that, that are needed, really. One is that specialist deep skill where it's needed to do something for the organization. But I absolutely agree. You know, we don't, we, don't, we don't all turn to the finance department every time we want to do a financial calculation or an MPV business case because we understand that to a level, understanding and being competent with finance is an intrinsic part of any business role. I think the same thing is, needs to become true of technology and within it, doing that safely, securely, effectively, affordably, and so on and so on. So, um, you know, I, I'm not saying for a minute there won't be for a long time to come an IT department, I think, whatever you call it, and there will be IT dedicated people. 
but technology is becoming a thing that's much more intrinsic and embedded uh, within all organisations as opposed to a distinct department of people that do things to the organisation. And I think that's the point you were, you were, you were largely well, yeah. making about ownership. I, I, think, that, I think that's right. I, 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 think, I think you've got to align ownership you know, within your business. You've got to li align the ownership with the skill. Hmm. Uh, I, there, is a, there is a parallel, I totally agree with you, there's a parallel uh, trend which is for some skills to become less just the reserve mm -hmm. of a specialist mm -hmm. department and needing to be spread across the organization. And out of those two trends, I think, in the matter of the Internet of Things, we've got to make absolutely sure that this one, this threat doesn't go unnoticed. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I, I also see that, you know, we're talking about security in organizations that don't typically practice security or roles or companies. And, I think one of the challenges is security is in almost every industry and across everything now. And so one of the, the items I feel like we're missing always is education early on, no matter what job or career you're going to go into, they give you the sort of basic um, education around security. And it's incredibly important. And I'm just surprised we really haven't focused on it yet because it's those users at the end of the day who are gonna, either they're gonna know what to do or they know who to contact or that they need to get help in these areas. But again, I would applaud, I think we're doing a good job in the UK. In the UK Cyber Centre, the 10 steps to cyber security. As security experts, I'm sure there are things that if you've ever read, you've, you've looked at them very quickly, but that, that's what these things are, are attempts to begin to uh, educate to your point, everybody, frankly, both consumers and generators of products and services, uh, to understand that technology is increasingly becoming something likened to finance. You've just got to have a base competence. There's a level of base competence that you, you wouldn't expect anybody to run a business that, that didn't have a clue at all about finance and how numbers worked. And, mm -hmm. and, and we're getting to the point where some understanding of technology, however you define it, is becoming that important as well, and security within it. And I think the UK is relatively unique in that, you know, the NCSC and a number, number of other organizations are really focused on pushing security uh, closer to organizations, the commercial organizations in the country, where we just, although the US may have started ahead in terms of understanding attacks, uh, major attacks, I don't think the government has taken us as far as in sort of combining the government resources with commercial resources and, and helping them improve from an education standpoint. But it's a wider thing than that, Thomas, isn't it? I think that's what you're getting at, that uh, people throughout the organization have to be aware that if they actually click on mm -hmm. a phishing attack, then you know it's, it's it's a minor thing, but it can actually lead to a major breach. I think it's it's context, like we talked about before, yeah. just understanding what's what is phishing email, what's the impact of it, what are mm -hmm. my roles. And I think there's a number of topics that we need to sort of educate individuals mm -hmm. on, and then specializations in, in universities, for example. If I'm a computer science major. I should be understanding how to code securely, yeah. which most yeah. or, most universities don't, don't do. That's incredible mm -hmm. to me. So I get developers, and now I have to educate them as Absolutely. as a security expert, and provide them with some information. And that's always amazing to me. So that, I'm glad you led into that because <laughs> <laughs> one of the last things I want to talk about is uh, every CIO, CTO I talk to says that I, I just can't get the people with the right skills. There is this big skills gap. Mm -hmm. What's your take on that? I'll happily go first. <laughs> um, so um, the Met Office runs an engineering division of probably 400 people, um, of which about 350 are permanent people and about 50 people that we bring in with specialist skills or, 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 or for capacity reasons and so on. And in that, definitely, we would be one of those saying, you know, come on universities, you're not producing what we need. But I think, to be fair, uh, what we need is highly contextual. And I think every organization is highly contextual in, in the skills that it requires to adopt technology and do useful things with it it's mm -hmm. and I, I, I'm seeing it more and more of this and you know uh, we, we had the conversation earlier on about the validity or otherwise of things like phrases like internet of things or digital or big data they all mean something but they don't very much frankly and it's only when you get within a certain context these things take on a life and you can describe them in in, in pointier terms and then obviously the skills and experience required to do the, do that thing is by definition highly contextual so I don't think there's a you know a, all computer science people should do a, a few modules in security. I don't think that kind of thing hits it. I think there's a, um, uh, uh, personally a need for, uh, I'll keep it to technology rather than more widely, but a complete change in the way that we think of um, education. And this notion that you do an undergraduate's degree and you that's it, your learning is over, you're now a specialist in whatever you do and off you go and do your work is, is, is terribly outdated. And I think technology see it 
very starkly because of the ever relentless increasing pace of change. So it's, it's impossible actually to sit somebody down and, and give them a degree in computer science and then expect them to be uh, to be competent. I think this brings together a couple of our conversations actually because you know that that general IT or digital skills being per pervasive is is a sort of a lower level than you know training somebody to be a coder. Yeah. Um, but it's also about that younger generation coming through. And you know what we at the Trust do is that we, we are about building digital skills. So we have programs like Get Into Technology, Get Into Robotics, and, and we work with business partners like, uh, like Vodafone and, and others who run those programs with us. But you know we have to see that there is actually a, a, a really big gap in the UK. I mean, we released a report earlier this year with Samsung about that, that gap and those young people slipping through the net, is what it was called. And we have to try and look at those young people, say that we understand that they actually learn differently. Mm. You know, they are all about, they want to go online and learn, they don't want to go to a face-to-face -face program. So how do we actually get those young people into a space where they are learning online at their own pace, where they've got specialist mentors who can actually help them and that's really where you know, I mentioned earlier we're looking at you know 100% growth over three years we're having to push really hard to get those young people on board. Uh, for me you know the, the, the skill shortage has just got steadily worse throughout my career um, the demands increased of course um, there, are, there isn't an easy solution to staffing a specialist security team um, there are a number of initiatives out there. The UK, I think, is, is, is again, doing really quite well in this space. There's the Cyber Security Challenge, there's the Institute, Institute of Information Security Professionals, and, of course, there's the IC squared CISSP qualification, which like, gets you to a certain baseline. <laughs> but, you know, none of those initiatives by themselves is ever going to generate enough uh, cyber security expertise to fill the gap. So I think, you know, for people like me forming security teams in businesses, there's another side to this, which is about looking for opportunities to take the, the more commoditized end of security and have it delivered in, in a much more efficient way. And, that, and that's about an interaction between the buy side of the security yeah. industry, myself and, and the sell side, like yourself, you know, David. The, encouraging the sell side to offer us better packaged, better price points f to do the sorts of things for us where there's no value to be added by having our own security people do it. So, you know, call it outsourcing, call it whatever you want to mm. call it. Um, if we can use, pull that lever as well as, in, as supporting these initiatives to grow cybersecurity skills, then we maybe stand a chance. But it's... I don't have an easy answer to this as a, as a security so security professional. security as a service? Yeah, I mean, this is, yeah, this is what it would involve. I mean, yeah. you know, there are, there are people offering virtual CISO services to, to, mm -hmm. to small and yeah. medium-sized businesses as well. Virtual That's DPS part of the solution. Mm -hmm. You know, we've, we've got to find some way through this. I don't think there is an easy answer. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, right now, I think this is one of the biggest threats to us as businesses doing enough security. I mean, I've had worked in the, in the past 10 years I've had uh, three different companies I've been with and we've had an open position for information security trained individuals for that entire time. So basically give me everyone you can, I will use them and I will make money with them in a consultancy, right? It's just, it's, it's a supply that we just will never have. Uh, so for me it was really, it's really a couple of things. In organizations I think try and buy too many products, they lead with technology and that requires a lot of people to run it. And so being smart about your purchases is really important for that perspective. Uh, we see a lot more focus on automation and I'm skeptical at the moment that that will solve much of our problem, but I think it can solve some of it. I don't think it res resolves uh, or removes that much headcount requirements, but it does help make your existing staff more effective. Uh, and then the third is really, we're just gonna have to rely on building resources that aren't security professionals into security professionals. And I've done it throughout my career, and it works relatively well because you develop in your organization, they have your culture, and they're more likely to stay longer, and that's been my experience. So uh, one of the better hires I've had, and he's worked with me now at two organizations, was uh, a nuclear engineer from uh, Berkeley, right? Very smart individual, not trained in security, who after six months uh, was able to pick up enough to be a very successful consultant and, and, and now a programmer. So it's those types of 
strategies that we have to, uh, to use because you're, you're right, there's really just no easy solution for this. You know, I, I see a disconnection between uh, you know, how are we uh, producing at universities graduates and post graduates and what the market requires. So the, the mm. world is getting more and more complicated, but our universities are still acting as they have been acting in the last 20 years. Mm. So you have you know, uh, uh, fantastic skills in a very solid, yeah. specialized mm. uh, uh, area. But we're, you know, the world is getting more and more complicated, so we don't need mm. uh, solid uh, organizations because mm. we cannot afford the changes if you are organized in silos. Mm. So, yeah. But on the other side, you know, the people you are getting from the universities are educated to be part of a silo. Mm. And this this kind of a disconnection. So part of the change that we will face in the next coming years uh, has to happen on the education space for sure. This is a bit different in the states where you know people tend to um, combine different uh, different bits of education. But here in Europe, you know, we have people spending five years, you know, in a career that ends up with a, you know, a, a nuclear engineer yeah, yeah. Uh, applying for a security job. It's, mm -hmm. It doesn't really make sense. I mean, in terms of social investment, we're making, we're still making huge investments on educating people. That then, after they come out, come out of the university, they have to continue to invest yeah. to adapt themselves to the yeah, market we, needs. We, we talk a lot about I's and T's, and I don't know if you're familiar with that way of describing <laughs> skills. But um, you know, uh, I do, I do smile at the hunt the unicorn races. So you know, some of the descriptions out there, things like data science, for example, where you know, you're going to have a PhD in machine learning. You know, the, the, the. Um, the fact of the matter is that you know. And I think I agree with everything that's been said. And these are this is demonstrating that it's going to require a blend of approaches. But one of those, for sure, is becoming more effective at multidisciplinary teamwork. Um, just as a, as a wrap up, um, for the youngsters, is this is this a, a good area to get into? Well, my, my son starts his uh, starts his, uh, his his themed degree at the Montford University in cybersecurity next week. So that will give you a clue <laughs> of the advice that I'm giving <laughs> people close to me. <laughs> What, what? It's, it's a uh, cybersecurity, IT generally is, from, to my mind, still the, the place to go. Where it's at. The challenge will continue for the foreseeable future, so get in now. You know, I have two grown up kids, 17 and 19, and I completely refuse to advise them. <laughs> uh, I have to, otherwise they'd just stay in my house eating my food, watching my TV. So I don't think my kids would look to me for any advice. <laughs> so. no, I'm, I'm, I'm really critical with you know, how do we organize the education of our kids. Yeah. So I don't, I don't have an answer, actually, but I truly believe that the way we uh, uh, have organized our education efforts does a work for the future. So it's, you know, it's complicated. Probably uh, my, my best advice will be, well, uh, try to do what you really like to do mm. and, and, and get a mix of different education bits from different schools and different institutions. Um, but, you know, I, I honestly, I think the traditional education path doesn't work anymore. Mm. Well, I mean, I have an 11-month-old uh, at home, and so my timeline's maybe a little mm -hmm. bit different. You're not advising her. No, not, not yet. She, yeah, she's just disrupting my sleep at the moment, but yeah. Um, my, my thought process on this is that uh, we're going to see lots of jobs disappear over the next 20 years, and most of them are going to be automated. And so That's true. Trying to focus mm -hmm. your career on something that you're passionate in, I think, is number one. Mm -hmm. But number two is areas, that breadth, but also areas where you can't really automate a solution, something that mm -hmm. requires creativity. And security is certainly that area where, in incident response, there's lots of details you have to assess mm -hmm. and compare and relate and analyze, and that's not something I see, despite the claims about AI, I don't see that being solved by computers. We're still going to need humans to do these jobs. Um, same thing with developing a code, being great coders. Uh, I don't see that being something, it could be, that we, do, we automate in the next 20 years. But, but not an auditor. Not an auditor. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I always have accountants, I think. <laughs> You're passionate about it. <laughs> two, two professions, I can't mention the other. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this is a hot topic for us, you know, yeah, sure. we, we put, you know, 70,000 young people a year in, 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 into new jobs mm -hmm. and those jobs are, are, those entry level jobs are disappearing, you know, so we have to work out how do, how do we spot the jobs that we need to educate and train people to do. And so I think if we're talking about cybersecurity, absolutely, mm -hmm. that, that is a, 
that's, that's the, it's one of the jobs that is going to be growing and, and we need more of, but we also have to find solutions for a lot of those other young people. Mm. You know, driverless cars, mm. that's going to affect an awful lot of young people mm. in terms of, of things. So yeah, so it's uh, really Big important. One.